Hey guys, in today's video, we're going to be making this interactive physics based racing simulator, and then we can use the rig to control any car model in real time. And then I'll show you how to capture that live performance and turn it into a polished animation. And how would you like three to five times faster cycles renders without needing to upgrade your graphics card? If you would, then check out Turbo Tools version 4, link in the description below. And you can get the scene file with a full rig ready to put onto your own car from the members area at 3d-illusions.co.uk. So we'll start off, we'll add the car body, Shift A, and we'll use a cube. And then we'll add a wheel, Shift A, a cylinder, Rotate it on the X by 90 and we'll move it into place. And make sure as well, we turn on the move gizmo so we can see the local coordinates of each object. I'm going to scale this down and I'll scale it on the Y axis as well. And we'll just look at the measurements, get it roughly real wheel dimensions. And I'll select both objects and apply the scale. We're going side view. And I'll move the wheel across a bit this way. And we'll move the car up. And I'm going to edit mode, X ray mode, into vertex mode. And then we'll move this down a bit. Make it look a bit more like a car. So choose edge mode, choose this edge, control B. We'll bevel that across somewhere like that. And I'll set the edge loops all the way around. And then we'll give those a bit of a bevel as well. Right click Shade Smooth Auto and right click Shade Smooth Auto on this one as well. I'm just going to top view and I'll bring that wheel a little bit closer. Making sure I leave space for the wheel to turn. So maybe a bit further this way. And I'll duplicate this Shift D and move it on the Z. We'll rotate it by 90 degrees. We'll scale it on the Z up a bit. And then I'll scale it down. And this is going to be the suspension and apply the scale. So what I want to do is add a floor, Shift A, add a plane, we'll scale it by 100, move it down so it's below the car wheel, and now we'll start adding rigid body simulation physics to these objects. So for the car, I'll add a rigid body, I'll make it 50 kilograms, and we'll leave it as convex hull for now. For the wheel, we'll do the same, rigid body, I'll make this three kilograms, and I'll make this one a cylinder. That'll make sure it's nice and smooth so when it interacts with the other physics objects, it doesn't bounce around all over the place. And we'll do this one as well. Rigid body. Leave that as one kilogram, convex hull should be fine. So what we need to do now is start constraining these to each other using physics constraints. So let's add an empty on this one. Shift S, we'll do cursor to selected. Shift A. And we'll add an empty, make it a single arrow. And very importantly, make sure you're in local at the top. And we need to make sure the X is pointing outward and the Z upward. So R, Z, negative 90. Now the X is pointing that way. And we'll add a rigid body to the empty. So in the physics tab, click rigid body. And we're going to change this to be generic. And I want it to be locked to the suspension, but able to rotate around the X axis. So in the settings, we'll say for the angular, so that's the rotation, we don't want to constrain it at all, there's no limit on the X axis. But for the other two, we'll set those to zero, so that it's only able to rotate on that X. And now to make sure it sticks completely to this, we'll set X, Y, and Z for the linear to zero. And for the first object, we'll choose the suspension. The second object, we'll choose the wheel. And now we need to add one to this as well. So Shift S, cursor to selected. And for this one, we need to make sure that the Y is pointing forward and the Z is pointing upward. So I'm going to rotate it on the Y, RY, by 180 degrees. And now I'm going to rotate it on the Z, so the Y points forward, so RZ 90. And just do it RZ180. There we go. 
and we're going to add another constraint to this one. So shift A, empty, and we'll go with the single arrow again. And for this one, we'll make sure the Y is pointing forwards again. So RZ90 on the Z axis. And now we're going to constrain this to the car. So rigid body constraint, we're going to use a generic spring this time because we want it to be able to spring up and down. So for angular, I'm going to lock it on the X and the Y and set those to zero. But on the Z axis, this is going to be able to turn the wheel so we can have steering. So for the Z axis, I'm going to limit it to negative 30 and 30. And for linear, I'm going to limit it on the X and the Y to zero so it can't move this way or this way. But for the Z, I'm going to limit it to go up and down negative 0.5 and 0.5. And then we'll choose the car for the first and the pension for the second. And if we play this back, we need to add a rigid body to the floor. So rigid body, make this one a passive, so it will interact with the physics, but it won't actually move itself. I'm going to change this to mesh. The reason is, when we start modifying the shape of the floor, we need it to be set to mesh so that the physics bounding box can conform to all the contours of the ground. We'll set the friction of the floor to 1, and we'll set the margin to 0 0.01. That'll just allow the wheel to get closer to it before it starts reacting. If we play this back, we've now got physics working, but you'll see the car's dropping down because it's so heavy. So we need to, for the spring constraint, we need to add a little bit of stiffness on the Z axis. So I've come to the Z linear, and I'll change this to something like 500, and maybe make the damping 50. And now if we play it back, it's not quite enough. So let's make this 2000. Play that back, and there we go. What I'm going to do now is copy all of these to the back. So I'll choose both of the empties, the wheel and the suspension. We're going to side view. I'll do shift D and move these on the global X axis. You want it a little bit behind the body if you can, otherwise it might do a wheelie, which you don't really want. So let's play this one. Now the back wheel, we don't want it to be able to rotate on the Z axis. So I'll choose this spring and I'm going to change the z-axis to be locked to zero. If we play this one back, there we go. Next thing we need to do is add motors to the steering and also a motor to the back wheel. Now a motor will always rotate around the x-axis. So let's add, let's copy this one, the spring, we'll do shift D. And so we can see it more easily, we'll go into the data panel and change it from a single arrow to arrows and the because the motor will always rotate around the x we need to make sure the x is pointing upwards so ry 90 negative and now we can see we've got that x axis pointing upwards and we'll change it under the physics tab from generic spring into a motor and it's going to be an angular motor so let's turn that on and the target velocity will control which way it turns and the max impulse will control how fast it turns. So let's change this to 20. And let's play this back. And if we change this now, we can rotate the wheel by either making the target velocity negative or positive. So I'll set that back to zero and reset the simulation. For the back wheel, we want to add a motor. So let's choose this one. We'll do Shift D. And again, we'll change it into arrows. Very importantly, the X needs to be pointing this way so that it matches this one, which it is, so that's fine. And we're going to change this one into a motor. Make it angular again. And we'll change the impulse to something like 20 and max velocity to 30. Let's play this one. And now you see that wheel's trying to turn. And if I turn up the impulse, you see it's going to turn much better. I reset that. 
We'll set the target velocity to zero for now. We want to copy these across now to the other side. So let's put a 3D cursor in the middle of the car. Shift S, cursor to selected. I'm going to front view or back view. And we're going to toggle X-ray so we can select all the way through. We'll select these and I'm going to duplicate them. Shift D, right click. And before we do it, we need to change this to global for the transform orientation. And we're going to change this to 3D cursor. And we very importantly need to change the options to only affect the locations. And then we'll do S, Y, negative one. And now we've got a, a duplicate on this side, but because we've chosen locations only, it hasn't scaled the empties, which is very important because we need these to be orientated in the same way as they are on this side. Let's play this one back. And that seems to be working pretty well. So what we need to do is be able to control the values of these constraints, these physics constraints, more easily. We don't want to have to come in each time and modify them individually. It's, otherwise it will take forever. So what we're going to do is set up a controller to control the actual car's movement. And also we'll give it some custom properties to automatically set all the different values in here more easily. So we'll duplicate the workspace and we'll call this one driving. And we'll change this one into a 3D viewport. Bring that down a bit. And we're gonna add a controller object to the world origin. So shift S and we'll say cursor to world origin. And then shift A, we're gonna add a circle. Make sure we turn off locations only and that will allow us to scale it. So scale it up a little bit. And we'll apply the scale. And over here, I only want to be able to see the controller. I don't want to see the car. So I'm gonna put this into its own container or its own collection. And we'll call this car control. And then I'll rename it the object to car controller. And over here, I'll press the N to open the end panel and under view, we'll scroll down to collections, make it a local collection so that it doesn't affect anything over here. And then we'll turn off the main collection so that we've only got the car controller collection visible. All right, so I'm gonna use the X and the Y location of this to control the motors that drive the car forward. So that's gonna be the Y location and the motors that steer the car, and that's gonna be the X location. And I want to limit this to only be able to move 10 meters in each direction. So we go into the constraints panel and we'll add a limit location. And we'll set this to be all three. And on the X and Y minimum, we'll set this to negative 10. And on the maximum, we'll set it to 10. For the Z, I'll leave both of those to zero, just so that it can't move up and down on the Z axis. Now, if I try and move this beyond those, that area, it's not gonna be able to. So let's choose the motor. We'll do the back wheels first. So choose this motor. Go into the physics tab. So we've got our motor constraint visible. And we want the Y location of this to control the velocity. So right click it, and we'll say add driver. And we want it to be on the transform channel. And we're going to use the car controller object on its Y world space. So it's global location. We don't need this plus afterwards, but we'll make it multiplied by 10. So that means that if this moves its full locate, its full distance of 10, then the max value of this is going to be is 100. So 10 times 10. And let's copy it. So copy the driver. And in actual fact, let's just try it first. So start the simulation. And I'll move this on the Y location. And as I move it forward, it's turning, but it's going the wrong way. It's turning backwards. So let's go back into the driver. And to fix that, we'll right click, edit driver, and we'll just say negative in front. So that's going to invert the value. Press enter. And let's just turn up the max impulse a little bit, maybe 50. So it's got more acceleration. That's the torque, basically. Now we'll grab this one. GY, and as I move it forward now, the car's going to go in the right direction. Pull it back, it's going to come backwards. So let's copy this driver by choosing the motor again, right click, copy driver, 
and then choose the one on the other side, right click and paste driver, and we'll set the impulse to 50 as well. Now I want to be able to control the impulse on both of these using a single value. I don't want to have to come into both each time I decide I want to change the acceleration. So what I'm going to do is choose this object and we'll go into the object panel. Down to the bottom, we've got custom properties. So I'll create a new one. We'll go into the little cog icon and we'll name this one to talk. Default value will go with 20 and the minimum is zero. Maximum will go with 100. And we want it to go in steps of one, so we don't need a precision at all. We don't need a decimal place. I'll set this to zero, and we'll say OK. And now we've got this available, and we can also see it in the end panel under the items properties at the bottom. So if we right click this, and we'll say copy driver, copy as new driver, we'll go back into the motor, under the physics, and then for the max impulse, right click, and paste the driver and now that's got a value of one so go into this one as well and paste it there and then in this object we'll change that torque to 50 now if we go back in here we can see that's updated in this one and in this one as well so we don't need to mess about doing it each time so we'll do the same thing for the front motors now for the steering so i'm going to choose the front motor which is that one. Right click the target velocity, add driver, and we'll choose the car controller again. But this time we're going to use it on the X location. Okay, and then we'll give that a test. So press play, and then we'll move that on the X axis. And now you can see we've got correct steering on there. So let's copy this driver now to the other side. So right click, copy the driver. And then we'll choose this one, the motor on this side of the car. Right click, paste that driver in there. And now, play it back. And we'll move it on the X. Both wheels are going to turn. And they're both turning in the right direction because when we, when we scaled it across the other side, we had locations ticked. So it didn't mess up with the, uh, the transform of the empties. Now we've got a bit of a problem here. If I move this on the X axis, we can turn the wheel, but when I put the wheel, when I start coming backwards towards the centre, you see the wheel isn't turning back with me. And that's because we don't have enough stiffness on the actual spring here. So the spring's not pulling it back into place. So to fix this, we'll choose this spring. And we'll come in here, and for the Z angular springiness, we're going to add some stiffness. So let's add, say, 150. We'll set the damp into 50 so that it doesn't wobble all over the place. And then GX. And even though I've added that stiffness, the wheel is still not turning back to the centre. And this is because on the motor, the max impulse, even though the velocity is set to zero, the max impulse is stopping that spring from pulling it back fully. If I set this to zero, then you'll see it pulls straight back. I think this is a bit of a bug in Blender, but it's not a problem. We can work around it. So what we need to do basically is say, when this empty, when the controller is at zero, we want this to be zero. And as it comes left or right, we want the impulse to increase. So we're gonna to have to add a driver to the impulse as well. So let's add a driver. And we're gonna choose the car controller on its X location. And we want it to go up to 20, so it's the, because the car controller can only move 10, we're going to have to multiply this. So let's go with multiply, multiply 2. So that's the power of 2, basically. That'll make sure the value rises quickly as we move away from 0. If I play this back, GX, you see we can now turn it in both directions, and that's working pretty well. And if we let go, it's going to flick back to the middle. So let's copy that driver to the other side. Uh, under the motor one, right click, max impulse, copy driver, we'll come to this motor, right click, paste driver. We'll reset it, and let's give that a try, GX. We'll put it back to the middle, and for this one of course we need to do the spring as well. 
So let me, I can't remember what we did. Let's have a look. The value was 150 and 50. Let's go up that one. And we'll set this Z under the spring section to 150 and 50. It won't take effect until we restart the simulation. So we restart the sim, press play, GX, and now it's working. All right, so let's give this a test drive. It's pretty good. Perhaps not quite enough friction. It's sliding around a little bit too much. So I think we're going to need a little bit more friction on the ground, probably. So we'll choose the ground. We're going to physics properties, and I'll set the friction in here to two. And then on the wheels, we've only got the friction to 0.5. So we'll choose all of the wheels, and we'll alt click. By alt clicking, it means it will change the value for all of the selected objects. And I'll set this to one. Let's give that a try. There we are, much better. We can make the simulation a little bit faster, so we're going to the Scene tab, and under Rigid Body World, we'll change the speed of the simulation to 1.5. Uh, solve, solve iterations 20 and 50 should be okay. I'll maybe put it up to 30, just to uh, give us a, a little bit more quality in the calculations. The weight distribution, so the center of gravity, is where the origin is. So let's choose the car. You'll see the, the weight distribution is at the top. So let's just go onto frame one, and we'll go into options, origins. We'll move that down on the z-axis. Let's play that back. And now we should get better control of the car. Make sure we turn origins back off. Okay, so let's just add some materials and we'll modify the floor as well. So I'll bring up the button, I'll add a shade editor. And for the car, maybe I'll go with a red color. And we'll turn on EV rendering. So change it from cycles to EV. And we'll turn on the EV render engine in the viewport. I've got HDRI set up in the background as well. So that's just under the world tab of the shader editor. You can set your HDRI up like this. I'll go back to the object mode and I'll probably give this car a bit of reflection. So turn the roughness down. And for the wheels, I think we'll add a rubber material. And roughness should be, maybe go down a little bit, maybe about there. And I'll choose this wheel, this wheel, this wheel, and then choose this one last, control L, and I'll say link materials. And then for the little suspension bits, we'll choose new material again, and we'll make this one metallic. And we'll turn the roughness down a bit. So we'll select the other pistons, and then finally this one, Control L, M for Michael, and then they're all using the same material. For the ground, I'll add a new material, and we'll probably go with, uh, let's say, a grass. So I'm going to choose the principal BSDF, and because I've got the Node Wrangler add-on installed, which comes with Blender, by the way, I can press Control Shift T, and then I can navigate to my textures folder, and I'll find one I want. So I'll go with grass. And I'll choose this one for the base color, this one for the normal, and I'll say this one for the roughness as well. Say OK. And that will automatically set this all up for us. And we need to make sure that this is on UV, so it's using the UVs. And if the scale's too big, so the grass is way too big there, I'll do Shift A, and we'll search for a value node, we'll put this here, and we'll connect this to the scale. And now we can scale the grass up until it's the right size. Maybe about there. For the roughness, that's obviously too shiny for grass. So I'm going to come into the specular and in 4.0, you can use the IOR level now to turn that down. So it's been renamed from just specular to this. So probably something like that should be reasonably good. Maybe a little bit too glossy though. So I'll shift a We'll put down RGB curve node and then we'll just bring the bottom part up so that there's less black in the roughness. 
And I'd like it to match with that background color there, actually. So let's add another RGB curve node. I'll probably just darken it down a bit. Now we'll go into the green. And we'll take some blue out of it. And then we'll just darken the entire thing a bit more, I think. That'll do. So let's add some variation to the to the surface. We'll choose the plane. Go into edit mode. And right click. Subdivide. Shift R a few times. And then we'll go into sculpt mode. Bring up the tools. And we'll just start painting little hills for the car to go up and down on. Right click. I'll turn the strength right down a little bit. And now we can start painting on there. Let's just turn on matcap and we'll go for a clay so we can see more easily where the lumps are. All right. Now we need to move it down, obviously. So GZ, so it's underneath the car again. And if we play this back, the car's going to travel around on that new mesh. All right. So let's go back into EV mode. I'll reset the simulation. And we're going to put a camera now onto the car so we can have a first person view. So shift A, we'll add a camera. We'll do alt R, and then move it up a bit. I'm going to rotate it on the Z axis by 90. And we'll rotate it on the Y axis. Let's just change this back to medium. And we'll change this to local. So RX, bring that across. And then we'll move it back on the Z. And now look through the camera. And I'll do G, Y to move it down a bit. And under the properties of the camera, we can lower the focal, down, uh, focal length. So we can see a bit more. Press home so it fills the screen. And I can play it back. Obviously the camera's not yet going to follow. So we need to, we could parent the camera to the car. But the problem is when the body starts wobbling all over the place, the camera's going to be wobbling as well and that's going to make it difficult to steer basically so we'll use a child of constraint instead so under constraints we'll add a child of constraint and we'll choose the target to be the car body and i want it to not affect the scale and i only want it to affect the z rotation so clear inverse set inverse let's play this one back and if ever it does this it basically means it's using the old simulation. So reset it, go into the scene tab, we'll go into rigid body, and we'll just turn split impulse on and back off, and that'll, re that'll reset the cache so that we can then start driving again. There we are. So that's working perfectly. And I'll just quickly add some more objects for the car to collide into, and we'll give those some materials as well. And for these ones, we need to add a rigid body, so I'll just select them all. I'll do object, rigid body, add active. I'll play that back. They're all going to drop down to the floor. But we can see that was actually quite slow to simulate, and that's because they're all using convex hull. So let's go into the physics settings. And for each of these, we'll change the shape to something that simulates a little bit quicker. Select all the cubes. I'll alt click in here and choose box. And then for these ones, I'll alt click again in here and choose cylinder. So they should calculate much faster now. Let's just have a drive. Turn off overlays. Now we start driving through all the objects in the scene. Now I want to get some shadows in there as well. So let's go into the EV settings. I'll just turn on ambient occlusion and we'll turn the distance up so we get shadows under the car, so it looks way better. We can also turn the viewport and samples down, maybe something like three. And we'll turn off viewport denoising as well. Otherwise, we're going to get like a ghosting effect when we drive along. Play that back. And it's all working very well. So I think what we can do now is move on to getting this rig to control an actual car model. So I brought in one of my favorite models. And I'm going to put this into its own collection. So I'll go into the layout tab. And while it's all still selected. I'll press M, new collection, and we'll call it Big Head. 
Well, let's just minimize over here. And then for the physics, I'm going to put these in through and collection as well. So Z, toggle X ray, so I can select all the way through. And we'll select all of those. I don't want to select the controller though, so B, middle mouse wheel to held down, and we'll deselect that one. I'm going to put those into a new collection and we'll call this physics car. And minimize that. Okay, so it's very straightforward to do. Basically, all we need to do is parent the wheels and the body of this car onto the one on the physics rig. And to make it easier, I'm going to parent each of the wheels to their own empty so that it can move all of the wheel elements at once. Shift S with the wheel selected, and we'll say cursor to select it. Shift A, and now we're going to add an empty, and this is going to be a cube. We'll scale it down, and then for all of these objects, I'm going to parent it to the cube. So choose this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then we'll choose a cube last, Control P, and parent to the object, making sure I'm on frame one and the simulation isn't running. Now I'm going to copy this cube, Shift D, and I'm going to select this wheel, Shift select it, and then we'll do Shift S, selection to active, and now we'll parent all of these to the new cube. Okay, Control P, and now I can move this around, and I'll just repeat that process for the two remaining wheels. All right, so the only thing left to do now is select this cube. We'll select this wheel. And it's important that the origin is in the middle of the wheel so that the cube snaps to the correct place, which it is in my case. So shift click this one, shift S, selection to active. And then this one, and this one, shift S, selection to active. And then I'll repeat for the body and the other two wheels. And then I'll set the physics car and the big head car and go into isolation mode so I can work on those without the ground getting in the way. And I've accidentally selected a few objects I didn't want, so I'll just unselect those and also unselect the controller on the floor, the circle controller, and then go out of isolation mode and then back in. So we've only got the car visible. So I'll select this object and I want to move it down a bit. Again, making sure I'm on frame one and the simulation isn't running. So move that down. I go into edit mode, I make sure I go into wireframe mode or toggle x-ray so I can select all the way through. I'll move that forward, move these ones back, and I'll move the top bit down a bit. Okay, now I'm going to come out of edit mode. We'll select this wheel and this wheel as well. We'll do Shift D to duplicate those. And then I'm going to join them together. In fact, before we do that, let's get rid of the rigid body on these. Select them both, Control J, into edit mode. I'm going to select the inside face on both. And now we're going to move them all the way through the car. We're basically going to use this as a Boolean to cut into the, into the car. I'm going to set all the faces all the way around. I'll do Alt S to scale along the normals, giving ourselves plenty of maneuverability for those wheels to move. Out of edit mode, we'll choose the car, into the modifiers, and we'll give it a boolean. And we'll choose this as the cutter, and then we'll apply it, and then we'll delete these. We need to make sure that the physics wheels are the same size as the wheels on the car model. We'll select both the front and the back wheel. So we'll choose the back one as well. Then we'll go into edit mode so we can modify them simultaneously. Turn off X-ray, this face and this face. I'm going to move those on the Y direction. And if you find that the rigid body cylindrical sort of bounding box isn't shrinking to fit the tire properly, then all you need to do afterwards is when you come out of edit mode, right click the objects and then choose origin to geometry. And that'll put the origin back into the middle of the wheel and then the bounding box will shrink correctly. 
In my case, it's pretty tight anyway, so I'm not going to bother. So I'll just finish off getting the width right, and then very importantly, I need to make sure that they're also not too big in diameter, because if they are, the model wheels are going to be floating in midair because the the, phys the physics wheels will be you know a different scale. So make sure we select all four of these wheels into edit mode number three. I'm going to choose all the outside faces. So Alt Shift click in like that, and then we're going to scale them down. So Alt S. We'll bring them in till they're the right size for the wheel. All right, out of edit mode. I'm going to choose the wheel mesh, so the actual tyres, and I'll parent that to the physics wheel. Control P, parent it to object, and now we can hide this one, so H, and then I'll repeat that process for the other tyres. We need to do the same for the body, so we'll choose the car body, and then the physics car body, Control P, object. And then we'll hide this one. And let's play this back. And you see we're getting a strange result. And that's because for the car physics body, we need to make this physics, instead of using a convex hull, we need to make it into the mesh so that it also takes into account those wheel arches. Let's try that. And there we go. So now we can hide that again. Now we've got the disc brakes. Obviously, we need to put those in place. We can't connect those to the wheel because we don't want them to spin. So we're going to connect them to the suspension. So choose this one and this one. Control P, object. Same for this one. This one to this one. Control P, object. And the same for the other two. If we play this back, now everything's working. And if you find that your car wheels, uh, you know, traveling too far, they might go through the car body, you'll need to modify the suspension tension and damping. So let's do that now. We'll add a control. We can come back out of here into the driving workspace, and then we'll choose the car controller, and we'll add a couple more properties, custom properties. So a new, we'll add two more. The first one, we'll call this suspension damp make the default value i think we go with 50 the min zero and the max maybe a thousand and we'll go up in steps of 10. precision needs to be zero well it doesn't need to but it might as well be because we're going in steps of 10 and then we'll say okay and then for this one we'll call this one suspension stiffness default value will go with 500 min will go with zero and max will go with maybe 2000 precision zero and we'll go in this one in steps of 50 and we'll say okay so we've got these available now over here i'm going to set the suspension damping what is it currently let's have a quick check so go into the suspension on this one, under the properties down here. The stiffness is 2000, the damping is 50. Okay, so we probably want to, on this one, make the suspension stiffness go a little bit higher than 2000. So we go back in here, down to the bottom. Suspension stiffness will make the max something like 5000. Let's say okay for that. I'm going to set this to be 2000, which it is currently. And the suspension damping, I think we said a maximum of a thousand, that should be fine. And I'm going to set that to 200. Currently it's set to 50, but I'm going to set it to 200. All right, so let's copy the suspension stiffness as a new driver. And then we'll go into the suspension empty. We'll go down here. And then we'll change this, right click, paste driver. So that's 2000 now from the driver that's been controlled from here. I'll choose this one again and this time suspension damping copy as new driver back into this one and then we'll paste that as a driver as well 
and we're going to do the same for the other suspension so this one what we could do to make this a little bit less tedious is if we open up another properties panel and we can lock this one onto this using the pin and go into custom properties we can now keep these visible so we don't have to keep going backwards and forwards so i'll choose this one you see we've already done that one copy the stiffness copy as new driver and then we'll choose this one and then paste driver and then for the damping copy as new driver paste driver and then i'll do the same for the two rear suspensions as well We also might want to change the maximum travel distance. So let's create custom properties for that as well. So new property, and we'll call this one max susp. We'll make the minimum zero and the maximum, let's say one. And the default we'll go with, we've currently got is 0.5. Precision on this one, we'll just go with maybe two. And I'll set this to go up in steps of 0.01. Say OK. And then we'll do one more. And before I edit the properties, I'll just change the max to 0 0.25 instead of 0 0.5. And then for this one, we're going to change this to be min susp. Default value will go with negative 1. And the min is going to be negative 1. Sorry, default value, negative 0.5. And max, 0. And again, 0 0.01 and 2 precision. We'll say OK for that. So now we've got all those available in here. And we can use those to drive the minimum max on each of the springs. So let's go firstly with the back suspension we've got selected. Max suspension. So copy this new driver. And we'll paste it into max Z suspension. And then min suspension. I'm going to put that to negative 0.25. So copy this one, copy new driver, and we'll paste this into the minimum. There we go. And we'll do the same for the other suspension as well. There we go. So now we can control the suspension using the values that we've got in there. So let's play that back and let's change the maximum travel distance then to 0.1 and these ones won't take effect unless we restart the animation so let's do that and to make sure it's reset properly i'll go into the scene properties and then under the rigid body world i'll just turn on and off the split impulse again i think i'd like a little bit more bounce in the suspension so i'm going to turn the dampen down to about 50 And maybe for this one, we'll go with 3000. That's lifted it straight up. So I think that's worked well. And then I'll basically just tweak these settings. So do the same for you. It depends on the weight of the car's body as well. So if you can decrease the car's body weight, that will have the same effect. But I'm just going to tweak these settings now until I find a value that I like. There we go. I think that's better. So we've got a bit of a gap on the back wheel. It won't have so much bounce, so it might handle better as well. And there we go, so we've completed it. Let's just give it a quick test drive. And for me, that's working really well. If you notice any strange behavior, then it's probably gonna be that your wheels are colliding with the objects, with the car's body. So just make those wheel arches a little bit bigger where we use the Boolean. And if you're sliding around a little bit too much, like these donuts that I'm pulling here, then just go into the physics setting for the ground and give it a little bit more friction. Go into the physics tab and maybe set the friction of the floor to something like three or two. Let's go with two again. So let's play that again. We're probably gonna to need to reset the simulation. Go for frame one. Turn that off and on. There we go. There we are, that's better. So turning the friction up on the floor, it's giving us a much better result. 
And one last thing we need to do before we record the final animation is just modify these boxes so they look a bit nicer. So into edit mode with all those selected, control B, and we'll just bevel those a little bit. And then we also need to select all of these extra objects. So select this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I've got all of those selected. And now I'm going to go into the physics tab and just make sure I alt click on this collision margin so that this is turned on for all of them. And then I alt click in this one and I'll set this to 0 0.01. This will set them all to 0 0.01 so that if they collide with each other, there won't be a gap in between them. And then I'll go into the scene settings. I'll set the speed to 1.5 and I think we're good to go. So I'll go back into camera mode and I'll try and record a decent run, which I can then turn into an animation. And with that done, once you've got one that you're happy with, come down into the scene panel under cache and just say current cache to bake. That will make sure that you don't overwrite accidentally the performance that you're happy with. And we should be able to play this back now. Then we can change cameras and watch the drive in action. Okay, so the final thing I'm going to do is just modify this grass material so that it blends in better with the background. We don't want this harsh edge at the corner. So I'm going to go back to the layout tab, make sure I choose the ground and the material we've got in here. All I'm going to do is plug something into the alpha so that it becomes invisible at the edges. So let's turn on rendered mode and we'll do shift A and I'm going to add a, a gradient texture. And we'll just look at this one. So control shift click on it so that it connects directly to the material output. And I'm going to change it from linear to let's try quadratic shift eight and we'll go with a texture coordinate node and we'll connect it to the object so that it's going to start at the origin of the object so i don't want quadratic then let's try spherical there we go so the idea is the white areas are going to be not see-through and the black areas are going to be see-through so let's just have a look at how this looks if we connect it to the alpha so we can go with the, with the fact, so I'll plug the fact into the alpha on here and connect this one in. And you can see it's visible around this area and then it becomes invisible towards the edges. So it's coming, it's becoming invisible a little bit too soon. So shift A and we'll put down a ramp. And then we can just look at this. And I want to make the transition from white to black begin further towards the edge. And now, if we go back into the principled, we can see we're getting a subtle fall off at the edge. And if we go into camera view, that's going to make it seem as though the transition is much more smooth. That should be fine. And then finally, I'll probably just tweak the color of the grass a little bit so it does blend much more nicely. If we go into the camera view, we'll just play this back now in the drive in workspace. I think that looks pretty good. Okay, so with that done, all we need to do now is set up uh, multiple cameras. I'm going to use three cameras. We'll use the one we've already got. When the animation starts, I want one to be on the floor, just down here. So we'll come back into the layout view. We'll come out of camera view. We'll turn the overlays back on. I want to put a camera here. So shift right click there, shift A, and we'll add a new camera. And I want this camera to be the scene camera at the moment. So I'll just rename the current camera which is this one, we'll call this car cam. And then for the new camera, I'll call this ground cam start. And I'll make this the active camera so that I can look through that one now. And in the view panel and the end panel, we'll say lock camera to view this one here. And now I can move this camera around. Let's add a timeline view. I'm going to go to frame one. I'm going to press M with my mouse hovered over the timeline. And that's going to add as a marker. And then with the marker selected, we can press F3 and just type camera. We'll say bind camera to marker. And that will bind the selected camera to the current marker. So the timeline will automatically make that camera the active camera when it passes frame one. So let's play it back and just adjust the camera if necessary.
And then at this point, I want to flick to a different camera. So we'll do Shift A. I'm going to add another camera. Let's go back to this view so I can rename it. And I'll name this one to, in fact, actually, we'll name this one to End Cam. And I think at this point, I actually want to switch to the, to the Car Cam. So I'll add another marker by pressing M again. I'll go with this one, in fact, and I'll choose the Car Cam. Let's change this to the Timeline in here. And then with this marker still selected, so it's white once you've selected it, I'll press Control B, and now we've got the car cam on this frame. So when we play it back, it will automatically switch cameras for us. So let's do this. And then it's going to switch cameras. And then here, I'll probably switch to another cam, which is going to be the end cam. So let me just find the end cam. It's probably going to be easier if we put all these cameras in a new collection. So let's just do that. Select all the cameras, press M, new collection, I'll just call this one cameras. Press minus to minimize this outliner, and then we'll just open up the cameras on its own. I'll press M to create a new marker, and for this one, I want it to be the end cam. So I'll select the M cam, and then I'll press Control B, and now the end cam is going to be selected in there. And we can position this where we want it. And if you're not happy with the timing of the camera change, you can just slide it wherever you want it. And then we'll see the car come across, reverse, and then go forwards and back around. I think that's fine. And we're finishing on frame 349. So let's go to the output, and I'll change this to be the end now, as 349. And let's start adding a little bit of interest to it with motion blur and depth of field on the cameras. I'm going to change, let's just bring up an outliner over here. And I'll select the camera that I want to tweak, so it's going to be ground cam start. I'm going to add some depth of field. So we go down to the camera options. We'll turn on depth of field. And I want the depth of field to follow the car. So I'm going to click on, I'm going to hover over this, focus on object, press E to bring up the eyedropper, and we'll click on the car. And then as the car moves, the camera will stay focused on it. And the F stop will control how strong the depth of field effect is. The lower, the stronger the effect. I don't want too much. I think I'll leave it at 2.8. And we can turn up the number of blades to eight. And then we'll turn the ratio of this to 1.9 so that the out of depth areas, the broker is sort of a, a stretched circle rather than just a circle. Or in this case, I think it's an octagon because we've got eight. And then I'm just going to tweak the position of the end cam and also set its focal length to something a little bit smaller, like 33. So we've got a wider view. Yeah, I like that. So with this camera, I'm going to choose the end cam. I'm going to add a little bit of depth of field on this one as well. But this time I'm going to focus on a specific area. So let's focus E on this one. I'll click here. So 8.1 meters. I'll turn the f-stop down quite a bit now. Maybe about there. Yeah, let's focus on the object instead. Yeah, that's nice. So a few last tweaks then. We need to add motion blur. So under the render settings, I'm going to go to motion blur. I'll just enable it and leave it at the default settings. It should be fine. All right, so we're ready to render. And then in the outliner, I'll just turn off the render icon for things that I don't want to be included in the final render, such as the physics car. I'm going to go to the output settings. I'm going to change this to be a FFmpeg. And I'll save it into the same folder as the blend file. I'll call it final render folder. And I'll call this final.mp4. If you put .mp4 on the end, then Blender won't append those frame numbers to it. That's fine. I'm going to change it to encoding to be MPEG4. Now, I'm going to be using turbo tools, which means that when I finish rendering, I'll have access to all the full quality EXR files in the compositor. If you're not using turbo tools, then it might be an idea to change this to a single layer EXR, and then you'll be able to access the full quality render 
files after you've finished rendering and you want to do some compositing on it. Because I'm using Turbo Tools, it's not necessary because Turbo Tools will automatically create those full quality EXR files in addition to the FFmpeg video. Okay, so with that done, I think we're ready to render the animation. So I'm going to go to the compositor, making sure I've got the image editor open. And I've got the render results showing so I can check everything's working correctly as I render. We'll do Control F12, check everything's looking all right. Motion blur is working well. So I'll let that finish rendering and then I'll come back in a second. All right, so that's finished rendering. Let's have a look at the final animation. We'll go, if you've got Turbo Tools, you can just go down here and look at View Published Animation. If you don't, go up to the Render menu, and then you've got View Animation in there as well. Click that, and it'll bring up the last animation you've rendered. There we go. So it's looking good. But we can make a few improvements to this now by adding things like lens effects. Now, again, if you don't have Turbo Tools, you're not going to have this cache node that's going to automatically load all the EXR files for you. In which case, you can bring those in by Shift A uh, as an image sequence. So, image sequence, and then you can navigate to wherever you save them to and open those up. And then you'll have the image sequence to use in the same way that I'm going to use this now. We'll do Shift A, and I'm going to add an RGB curve node. I'm going to add one for the black levels, Shift D, one for the white levels, Shift D, one for the gamma, Shift D, one for the contrast, and then Shift A, I'm going to add, in fact, we'll leave that for a second. Right, I'm going to add a viewer node, Control Shift click on this one to add a viewer node. And I'll hold Shift down, right click and drag to consolidate those into a new reroute node. Over here, in the image editor, I'm going to press N. I'm going to open up the scopes, change the waveform to parade, and then make it a little bit bigger. I'll just make just left mouse and drag to scale it down a little bit, so we can see the zero line here and the 100 line here. And the idea is we want to get all of the waveform between the zero and the 100. So we'll start off with the black level. Let's make it even bigger. And I'll set this to viewer node now. Right. So I want to get these bottom parts right down onto this, the zero line. So I'm just going to grab this and drag it very slightly to the right. And you can see that's brought it down. If you go too far, you can use the factor. Just reduce the factor a bit and that'll take it back up. So that's pretty much spot on for me. Next up, we'll do the white level. So we can see here, we're going quite a long way over the 100 part. Let me just make the opacity a bit brighter. So moving across to the white levels RGB curve node, I'll just reduce that a little bit until all of the main part of the waveform is below 100. And I'll probably remove the color cast actually before I do that. And the way to do this, let's find an area, a, a frame where something white is in view. So I think this is pretty white. So I'll press E. I'll click on that one. It doesn't matter if it's actually white in the view. It just means that it's something that you know should be white. So you click on that. And then we can bring this down until everything is in whoop, within range. I seem to have introduced some artifacts. Let me just see what's causing that. Oh. We've got film mic on. Let's turn these to standard. I'm not sure why they're on film mic. There we are, that's fixed it. And uh, very importantly as well, we need to make sure in the color management, this shouldn't be on filmic. You need to make sure that's on standard, non, zero, and one. So I just need to modify those black levels because for some reason the RGB curve node was set to film mic by default, which is unusual. Must be a new thing in Blender 4. Uh, but I've set them back to standard. We can just tweak these again very quickly. Back, need to get all those. There we go. And then this one. Bring those up to full. We'll do it again. E. We'll choose this. Now they're far too low, so I'll raise it up a bit. And we'll look at the result over here. Let's move that up a bit. You can see it's very dark. So what I'm going to do is bring the mid range up now. 
And now we can just add a little bit of contrast by bringing this one down just a tad and this one up just a tad. So let's play this back. If you've got Turbo Tools, you can play it back in here. If you haven't, uh, then you'll probably just need to go through one frame at a time using the arrow keys. And for performance, I'm going to make sure I turn this to frame dropping. Okay, and I'll play this back. And we can see in the in the viewport, in the compositor's backdrop, we're actually getting playback in there. So I'll just make some final tweaks now. And then finally, we'll do Shift A. And we'll add a lens distortion node. Let's just make sure I can see all of this in here. Let's turn that down a bit. And we're going to turn on some dispersion. So 0 0.01, you want to keep it quite low, maybe 0 0.02. If you go too high, it's going to be too intense. It's going to look a bit too strong on the sides of the screen, from the bottom of the screen top. So I'll go with 0 0.05 maybe, uh, 0 0.02. I think 0 0.02 is a good, a good value. I'll give it a little bit of distortion, maybe 0.1. We'll go maybe the other way, negative 0 0.02. So what I'm going to do now is republish this animation. If you've got Turbo Tools, you can just click on Publish Animation. If not, then you'll need to make sure you mute the Render Layers node and then render the animation. Uh, we don't need to do that with Turbo Tools. We can just click on Publish Animation. I don't want to overwrite the original, though. So I'll come over here and I'll say Final Graded. And I think I'm just going to, before I do it, just turn it down just a tad. We can hide this now, and I'll turn on Allow Viewer in the Turbo Tools option so we can see the progress of the publish in the uh, image editor. Click Publish. Now it's going to be writing out to a new MP4 file in real time that we can actually view over here the progress of it, just to make sure everything looks good as we go. And then if we do a side-by-side, -side, we can see the new version looks a lot brighter and a lot, uh, a lot more pleasing to the eye. And of course, we can animate those RGB curve values if we want to have different grades at different points in the animation. And what we could do as well is we could add audio to this. It, all we do is go into the, over here, under video editing. We'll create a new workspace of video editing. And we can drag an audio file in here and line it up with a car. So if we can bring in an engine, for example, um, let's just turn off show seconds. I find it very distracting. And a good website to get sound effects from is this website called freesound.org. And one thing to make sure is make sure you get one that's Creative Commons. Then you can use it in whatever you want. So I'm just going to search for some crowd sounds. And then inside of Blender, you can just drag those in. and then layer them up until you get a nice sound. And then maybe we'll get an engine sound as well. And we'll change this to the 3D viewport in here so we can align the engine sounds with the movement of the car. And in the timeline, we'll change it to sync to audio. And that'll make sure that the 3D viewport and the audio stay synced together so we can get the alignment correct. And if you want to make the audio higher pitched or play faster, we can use the retime controls to change the speed of the selected clip. And I'll bring the engine sound in, making sure I turn on the waveform so that I can see the area of the clip that I want to use. And then I'll reduce the volume a bit to get rid of any clipping that's indicated by the red lines on the waveform. And then I can keyframe the volume by hovering over the volume and pressing I to set a keyframe so that I can increase or decrease the volume depending on how close the camera is to the car. And then to manipulate those keyframes, I'll open the graph editor and then I can move them around or change the value much more easily. So all I'll do now is layer up these clips and manipulate the volumes and the timings until we've got a decent result. And then once you've set your audio how you want it, go back to the compositor 
And then I'm going to make sure under the encoding that I also turn on audio. So I want to be choosing probably AAC or AC3. I'll go with AAC. And that'll ensure that when I click publish the next time, or when you click render the next time, if you're not using turbo tools, that your animation will include the audio. So I won't overwrite this one. I'll put, I'll just rename it with sound. I'll save the file and then I'll click publish again. And then if we play this animation back, we should now have sound. <laughs> And there we go, so there's the full animation. I hope you find it useful. You can now control any car that you've got in your library. And don't forget, if you would like much faster cycles renders without needing to upgrade your graphics card, then check out Turbo Tools version four. It allows you to get generally three to five times faster renders without needing to worry about setting up samples. And it will also give you additional features that can be used for any render engine, such as the publishing features that we've seen today. And thanks to the new temporal intelligence that's been added in version 4, it can remove flicker from even the most complex denoised animations. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.